Texas A&M's matchup with Auburn is the most important game on the 2024 schedule. You are Locked On Aggies, your daily podcast on the Texas A&M Aggies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it's a crossover edition of Locked On Auburn and Locked On Aggies. I'm Zach Blackerby. He's Andrew Stefaniak. And we agree. We agree how important this game is in regards to shaping what I think the final standings are going to look like in the SEC. In 2024, Andrew, when the Aggies come to Jordan Hare Stadium, it's going to be late in the season. There's going to be a lot of questions that have already been answered, but there's a lot of teams vying for spots and positioning in this. That second tier of the SEC and the winner of this game is going to be in a really good spot when it's all said and done. No question there. And this is a football game. Looking at both teams, like you said, looking at both teams' schedules, you can't look at this football game and and look past the importance for both for both clubs here. I mean, both teams. This is a game where I think for Texas A&M, the importance comes from, you know, your road schedule is pretty, it, it's manageable. You know, it, this is the SEC. There's no such thing as an easy schedule in this conference. But sure. it, it's manageable. And your two most challenging games on the road are Auburn and Florida. And I am leaning, I'm starting to, buy in to Auburn, Zach. I'm starting to to buy more into what's happening over at Auburn and to where I, every day passes by, I get more and more concerned about this game than I was the day before. I think the Auburn Tigers are going to surprise some people this year. And, and I think the way the season develops, I think, could benefit Auburn. The fact that this game is played so much later feels earlier on. I still think the fact that it's in Jordan Hare Stadium gives Auburn a pretty big edge yeah. in this one but i mean we'll we'll see i mean you, you made the comment that there's no easy schedule in the sec and while i agree Ole miss is, is very very manageable this year props to Ole miss but i think both auburn and texas a&m and Ole miss and a lot of these sec west teams i think life is going to get easier for them now in this expanded sec where there's no sec west and no sec mm -hmm. east we're all in here together because they're not all playing each other yeah. anymore. You're going to get more Kentuckys sprinkled in there. You're going to get more South Carolinas. Auburn's playing Vanderbilt. You absolutely love that. And to me, instead of, okay, like for instance, Auburn is playing Vanderbilt and Kentucky when they would normally play Ole Miss, LSU, and Mississippi State. Yeah. And, and to me, that's just, it's, it's vastly different. It's vastly different. And I think the way... A team developed over the course of a season. A lot of that is correlated with wins and losses. I think the more games you win, the more likely you are to trend in a positive direction over the course of the season because you're starting to buy in. Yeah. And if Auburn can get wins at home against Oklahoma, if they can win on the road against Missouri or win on the road against Kentucky, to me, if they get two of those few games that we just mentioned there, they're going to be in a prime spot to take on Texas A&M and look to have nine wins going into the Iron Bowl or eight wins going into the Iron Bowl. I think Auburn fans would take either at this point. Yeah, and I mean, look at Texas A&M's schedule. You say the same thing. You know who Texas A&M does not play? Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia, or Ole Miss. I mean, you, you, now you play Texas, obviously joining the SEC, sure. uh, getting that rivalry back, which should be a really fun football game. Absolutely. But I mean, you, you look at this, and you're right. I mean, the SEC, the changing of the SEC, I do think is going to lead. It's gonna it's gonna help the West teams, the former West teams. You're right. I mean, Georgia got to play Kentucky and Vandy and all these, you know, South Carolina. These teams that just haven't been great historically. A when terrible USC, Florida team that's been bad for the last ten yeah. years. A Tennessee team that's been down for the last decade until mm -hmm. three years ago. Yeah. I mean, it, it's been a joke in yeah. the SEC East. And meanwhile, the the West is beating each other up. I mean, right. year after year. And, and so this is going to benefit both of these football teams, both of these programs, I, I think in a way, and it's going to make this conference just more interesting as a whole to see who's going to be able to, to bring this thing home every year. Is it going to lead to, to more wins for some of these middle of the road teams, you know, this year, I, which I would put Auburn and Texas and in both under that category, like you said, the second tier of the conference. Um, so Looking, like I said, at this football game, you're right. I think it does benefit Auburn when it's played. I think 
knowing that Texas a and is going to have to travel to uh, Jern Hare Stadium to play this football game, you know, we always say weird things happen there. I mean, if you're a SEC football fan looking, you know, Texas a fans on the outside looking in, you know what happens there. The, you know, the miracle and Jern Hare, the kick six. I mean, these things happen. Is there, has a time been released for this game yet, Zach? Is it, I don't think it is. is no, it I right? think it's flexed. Okay. So I'm just telling you this right now. If you're a Texas a fan, you don't want to go there and play under the lights. You just don't want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In November too. I mean, things happen. Um, things happen there. And, and Auburn's schedule is interesting. You know, they, they play their first five games at home yep. and then they don't play at Jordan Hare Stadium during the month of October. And so a lot of these Auburn fans <laughs> that buy season tickets, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be hankering to get back in there and they'll play home games before, before Texas A&M comes back. But I think this is going to be a fan base that's fired up, especially if the season goes the way that a lot of people are starting to think. You mentioned at the top there, more and more people are starting to sit down and actually look at Auburn and look at how favorable their schedule is compared to how it normally is and look at all the things that they've done to help Peyton Thorne at quarterback and kind of allow him to actually have pieces, actually have weapons for him to throw the football to. I think the offensive line is going to be better than it was a year ago and wasn't bad last season. And to me, I just think Auburn, when you look at it, it's like people are finally sitting down and doing their homework and doing their research, and they're saying, oh, wait, yeah, Auburn does have a pretty clear path to eight wins. Now, if they're going to win eight games, you got to think Texas A&M is one of them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, I mean, we're going to get – I think the meat and potatoes of this conversation is going to end up being what we talk about here in a few minutes, which is the quarterbacks, and we'll get to all that and the importance there. But you know what's going to be important, Zach? And we we hinted at it the last time you and I talked was is going to be the trench warfare. Yeah. I, I just – the matchup in the trenches in this football game is going to be so – crucial we talked about it last time i am a huge believer in texas a&m's defensive line sounds like you're pretty high on auburn's offensive line i know they went and got uh percy lewis is his name um and he's going to be a great player i've seen him i think in some mock drafts i mean he, he's a good player i think he's wow. got a lot of, he's got um he's got a bright future ahead of him he's not played his best football yet but when it comes so i think that's going to be strength on strength this is where it's going to get more interesting so obviously who wins the strength on strength battle I'm personally still taking Texas A&M's defensive line. You could have a real debate on this. We could go for an hour just on this. Sure. What's going to be more interesting than that is what I think could end up being either you could say weakness on weakness or question mark on question mark, which is A&M's O-line against Auburn's D-line. I know Auburn did a great job adding some pieces in the portal at the D-line, but is that going to be enough? So, I mean, like, Zach, I'd like to hear – I mean, can you, can you convince me – as to how this Auburn defensive line you think will be able to create havoc for Connor Wigman and the Texas A&M offense? They need somebody to step up. They need somebody to step up. I talked to to somebody within Auburn's program Mm -hmm. last week and asked them point blank, what do you think the defensive line is going to look like? They said, we'll see. We'll see. Somebody's got to step up. He said they felt the same way this year going into the season as they did last year, where they were concerned a little bit. There was some concern within the program a year ago But Marcus Harris played out of his mind last year, and there's a lot of folks that I've talked to within the program that say they didn't really see that coming. He didn't do that in practice, but he did it during games, and so nobody really asked any questions about it. Is Auburn going to have a guy like that? They brought in a bunch of dudes, brought in a bunch of guys via the portal, guys who have played a lot of of college football. Isaiah Rakes, the former uh, Texas A&M Aggie, is now part of this. Does he kind of step up a little bit more than normal? in this game that we're talking about that's like six months away? Or is it, you know, uh, a Philip Bleedy who's played a ton of college football at Texas Tech and at Indy or a Gage Key? I mean, there's so many different guys that Auburn's brought in on the defensive front. They need somebody to step up. They need somebody to step up because I think a lot of the guys they brought in, they're solid. They're not great. They haven't been like playmakers at their previous spot. They've just been solid. Mm-hmm. And they need somebody to be great. They need somebody to be kind of that guy to step up and kind of maximize um, a potential mismatch if Texas A&M has one up to that point. The other, I think the other huge factor in this is former Texas A&M defensive coordinator and now Auburn defensive coordinator, DJ Durkin. You got to think there's going to be a little extra bacon on, on this one for him. You got, you just know he's looking forward to this game. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that this one's going to be a little bit more emotional. It's going to mean a little bit more. 
Not that AM did them wrong or anything. Yeah. These are just hyper competitive people. Yeah. And I'm sure that that's going to be something that um that he kind of focuses on. But th the thing about like when you're talking about O line versus D line is one injury to somebody's offensive line totally changes this conversation. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's impossible to predict, but if we're assuming everybody's healthy and we're talking about the true best on best, I'd probably give the slight edge to Texas A&M's offensive line just because I still I still have questions about Auburn's D-line. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about Texas A&M's offensive line, it's never been a talent problem. You, the same can be said for every position group on Texas A&M's roster. That's it's right. It's always been a development problem. You bring in a new staff that is all about development. This is what they're here to do. They're here to develop these players. We know They're X's and O's guys. You know, we, we didn't know if Elko was going to be a recruiter, which ironically he has a number five class right now in 2025, which is, I still can't, people aren't talking enough about that, that he's done that that quickly. But, um, but I mean, it's probably not Elko. It's probably the, the ridiculous amount of money that, the tech yeah, has. but still, I mean, it, it, he was at Duke where he wasn't recruiting. You know, I mean, they were getting one stars, you know what I mean? He, he, he mm -hmm. was, it's a different pitch and, for sure. Yeah. So I'm with you. It, it's it, that's part of it, but I'm different still, tax bracket as well. Yeah. It's, it's, I wasn't expecting it to go as well as it's going despite the money, but you're right. It plays a sure. role in it. But, you know, the, um, I think that their Texas A&M's new offensive line coach, Adam Cushing, I think that he came, came with Elko from Duke. I believe that he is going to be able to develop this offensive line. And if he can do that, you know, we're in our minds, we're still living in the Jimbo Fisher era. The bad man is gone. Players can get better. This can happen. You know, sure. players don't have to be the same as they were the year before. Coach Cushing has proven that he can develop talent. What's to say he can't do that at Texas A&M? So I would give a barely slight edge to the Texas A&M offensive line, and I'm talking 51-49, but I think the trenches, in all honesty, it's the trenches and quarterback play where this game is going to be won, which you can yeah. say that pretty much every game. But and if it feels earlier in the season, I would say maybe the noise of Jordan-Hare Stadium impacts your snap count and your ability to communicate. But at that point of the season – once again, unless there's a major injury, everybody's going to be able to communicate, you know, without speaking at, at that point of the year. So I, I don't think that'll play as big of a factor. Let's talk about quarterbacks. Quarterbacks are always going to be a part of this, Andrew. And so that is coming up in just a moment on this crossover edition of Locked On Auburn and Locked On Aggies. Andrew, can you imagine? Can you imagine wagering on sports anywhere other than our friends at FanDuel. It would be utterly, I don't have a word other than insane to, to go anywhere else. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it makes me mad just thinking about it. I'm frustrated it. thinking about it as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that people go elsewhere. Uh, FanDuel has the best app. They've mm -hmm. got more props, odds, and lines than anyone else. And look, they're sensitive to the fact that it's summer, and if you're listening to a daily Auburn or a daily Texas A&M podcast, you love sports. You love them, and there's not a whole lot of them to go around during the summer. And so right now, you know what they're doing? Do you know what they're doing right now? All yeah. summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus every single day. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. single day. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer because Andrew FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of the MLB and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that believes in Texas A&M's quarterback play more than you. Would you agree with that? Um, I would agree. I have been calling. I've, I've started. I'm the official leader of the Connor Wigman hype train. Um, congratulations. Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's a big deal. You know, so if, would you if, say that or right, you're the conductor and you look back in the passenger car, how many folks are there behind you? Is it starting to fill up you think, or is it still just kind of you and, uh, and some of his family members? Um, right now it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of family, a lot of family, but people sure. are starting to buy in, you know, okay. so someone told me the other day, and I think this is the perfect way to describe Connor Wigman. I've, he has been described as I love this term. I love saying it. The uh, the best kept secret in college football, and I think it's a great great way to describe who Connor Wegman is right now because he plays a couple years as true freshman. I mean, a couple games as true freshman season. 
plays a couple games last year and then gets hurt against Auburn. I forget who it was. I think it was um I think it was Eugene Asante. Darn you, Eugene Asante. I'm just kidding. I remember who it was. But sure. um gets hurt against Auburn, you know, misses the rest of the year. And but he always is showing flashes. He just mm-hmm. hasn't been able to stay on the field. And mm-hmm. that's a big part of it. You got to stay on the field. If you can't stay on the field, it doesn't matter. But part of that is I think, you know, he got hurt because last year uh, because a player got in the backfield against Auburn. You know, someone got in the backfield and hit him. I mean, if you have better blocking, he's going to stay healthy, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. But when you watch him play, you go to NFL mock drafts. I, I've heard from NFL scouts. He has first round potential in this year's NFL draft. The NFL loves Connor Wigman, and there's a reason why. You know, those NFL scouts know a whole heck of a lot. You know what I mean? They look at film and they break this all down and they believe. And when I watch the film, I, I, I he's a great player. He hasn't well, been able to show it yet. Yeah, and and he's going to be able to throw to a, an exciting new option, the five star from Phoenix City, Cam Coleman. Yeah. Oh wait, he flipped. Never mind. Never he mind. He did. He did. He's on Auburn's team. That check bounce. He's on Auburn's team for sure. No, <laughs> I, I think, I think that's a great point that you bring up. I mean, obviously, this is going to be the case for most of the quarterbacks Auburn plays. Yeah. I have questions about Auburn's pass rushing ability. This goes back oh, to the defensive line yeah. discussion that we talked about a second ago. They've got a few guys that I really believe in their ability to rush the passer. Jalen McLeod, Kieran Crawford. Yeah. Kieran Crawford's a new guy that they just got from Arizona, uh, from Arkansas State. Mm-hmm. And then we're all assuming Keldrick Falk, former five-star. Um, we're assuming his second year he's able to take that step. Everybody I've talked to within the program believes it's going to happen. It probably will happen, but until it does, like it's still a variable, right? Yeah. And to me, when you look at what Wegman is able to do, you've got to throw him off balance. And Auburn did a good job of that until he got hurt. Like, it, yes, he, wasn't he was not playing well. He was he not was, playing well in that game. He wasn't, yeah. and, and it kind of makes you wonder how that game would have developed if he had stayed in because yeah. it seemed like Auburn kind of had his number. And so yeah. does that carry over? Like, Does that translate? Like, Probably not, but I do think that's going to be a factor in this. But you got to make sure Wegman is uncomfortable. Auburn was able to do that a year ago. Yep. Is their pass rush as good as it was a year ago? We'll have to see. Yeah. And, you know, we just got done, you know, sitting here talking about the trenches. And it sounds bland and generic because, oh, you know, this game will be won in the trenches and in quarterback room. You hear that every game. But in all honesty, I think this game is really where that's going to happen. Like, I don't look at the matchup between the receivers and the corners for each team and go, okay, you know, I look at it as those two groups, the trenches and quarterback is where this game is going to be won. And, you know, I'm as I, I can sit here and talk about Connor Wigman, like I am I will annoy you. We I, we will talk about it for an hour. I can, yeah. I can do it. Maybe two. Um, I, I'm all in. I think he's going to have a great year. He's got the weapons to do it. I think Colin Klein, the new offensive coordinator who comes to Texas A&M from Kansas State, uh, is a is a coach who, and I, I've told this, A&M fans, enjoy him now. He'll be a head coach in two to three years. So okay. enjoy him now. He's a great, great coordinator. I think he's going to elevate this offense. You know, last year with, um, you know, uh, Petrino, you really didn't get – I was excited about him, but Jimbo did that didn't not work. Yeah. yeah, Jimbo didn't give him the, the keys. That was the whole offseason conversation, one of the mm-hmm. biggest in the SEC, and he didn't let him have them. I think C- Coach Klein, obviously Elko is a defensive guy. It's Coach Klein's offense. He's a genius. I think it's going to go really well. But so, Zach, here's the deal. As I've said, Auburn fans, I'm coming around. I'm coming around. I'm a believer that Auburn's going to gonna overachieve this year. I think that they're going to um, really impress some folks. But, Zach, you have got to talk me in to Peyton Thorne. Like, could can you do it? Can you talk me into Peyton Thorne? Uh, no, but I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to yeah. try to talk you into Peyton Thorne, but I am going to talk try to talk you into everything that's happening yeah. around him. I mean, you, you mentioned Percy Lewis, the left tackle for Mississippi State that Auburn brought in to revamp that offensive line. You know, you brought everybody else back, and you feel yeah. really, really strong about what they're able to do up front. The, the eye test mm-hmm. from this spring, they look good. The O-line looks really, really good, in my opinion. They bring in Cam Coleman. They flipped him from somewhere. Where was it? Oh, it was Texas A&M. Yeah, they flipped him, the best receiver uh, best receiver in the, in the class. And, and he was he was exceptional throughout spring. Stole the show uh, at Auburn's 8A game. Um, they, they go out and get Keandre Lambert-Smith, who was kind of the number two guy at Penn State. They go out and get Robert Lewis, who was the number one guy at Georgia State, who... 
probably flying under the radar a little bit from what he was able to do this spring. He quietly had the most catches in Auburn's A-Day game. I think he's going to be a big part of what they do. And they brought back their running back room. Jarquez Hunter could be a player in the NFL. He chose to come back for another season. And you know Jeremiah Cobb and Damari Austin kind of are, are going to be the number two and the number three backs yeah. um, in no particular order in that room. And so to me, I don't think it's about Peyton Thorne. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what Hugh Freeze and this Auburn staff chose to do. I think they looked around in the portal and they said it's more effective to get the pieces around him to make playing quarterback easier at Auburn yeah. than it is to just go out and get a new quarterback. And to me, I think that was the right decision. But they've got to execute. Oh, yeah, and also Hugh Freeze is calling plays now, not yeah. Philip Montgomery, who was terrible. He was yeah. absolutely awful. So yeah. to me, it, I'm not going to sell you on Peyton Thorne because I don't need to. I need yeah. to sell you about everything okay. else. Yeah, and, you know, I'll tell you this. I, I feel a lot better, unfortunately, about Auburn's receiver room than I do a and And this is a conversation. Is it because of Cam Coleman? Because he yeah, was committed. I can't stress this enough. He, he was, was committed, he committed to Texas A&M. Okay, yeah, I remember that. That's and he flipped. High. Yes, and he flipped yes. from Texas A and M to Auburn. I just need to like really drive that oh, home. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right, that's gonna do it for today. We'll see y'all later. But um, you know, it's He's all kidding. He's you kidding. know, looking at at Cam Coleman and at this room, you know, Texas A and M's receiver room. Like my listeners over at Locked On Aggies, you know, the everydayers, y'all are gonna are gonna yell at me for for my thoughts on this because people disagree with me on this on my take on the wide receiver room. I think you have a lot of wide receiver twos. I don't think you have that that guy. And I think that's so valuable. I really do. I think having yeah. the guy. Well, and, and I think that's why Cam Coleman's the difference maker. Like, yeah. uh, Auburn's in a similar situation. They've got a lot of wide receiver twos, but then Cam Coleman comes through the door because yeah. he flipped. Once again, he flipped from Texas A&M to Auburn. Yes, that's... he did. Yes, he did. But, yeah. I mean, all these Aggie fans celebrating July 4th a year ago. Yeah. Yay, Cam Coleman. Yeah, I made fun of Not you. Anymore. I made I deserve this. I made fun of you on the Fourth of July last year, so I deserve this. this yeah, that's fine. This is that's fine. That's fine. I wasn't um, gonna bring it up, but yeah. you, uh, you know, it, it just keeps propping its way in. All right, who's gonna win this game when it's yeah. all said and done? Way too early predictions coming up. Yeah. We all agree how important this game is. There's no question. I've made the case it's the second. Biggest game on Auburn's schedule. I think it's Oklahoma one. Yeah. And then in the context of Auburn needing to overachieve, FanDuel has yeah. Auburn's win total at seven and a half. If they're going to do that, they need to either beat Oklahoma or Texas A&M. Obviously, if you beat both of them, that gives you a lot of wiggle room, both at home, different points of the year. To me, I think it's more likely for them to beat Texas A&M than Oklahoma. I don't, a lot of that has to do with just, gut feeling and I, I think Oklahoma's a better team than Texas A&M and, and I, I know you're high on on quarterback play and all of that yeah. but I just think like the upside of what Oklahoma has yeah. is better I just don't know if it's going to fully be meshed by week five when they come to Jordan-Hare Stadium it's their first road game it's their first road game in the SEC they've got a new offensive line so there, there's a lot of variables there I think Auburn beats Texas A&M. Yeah. I do think it's close. I don't think it's a high-scoring game. I think both defenses are going to come with a purpose in this one. But my way-too-early prediction, I think Auburn wins this game like 24-17, to 17, kind of in that range. That's my gut feeling, Andrew. Yeah. You know, the thing about Texas A&M, I, my honest take here on this, I don't think a lot of people, nationally even, I don't think, people don't know what this team's going to be yet. You know what I mean? I mean, you lose, you lose like a million dudes in the portal. You bring in a ton of guys, you hold on, you know, I don't know, maybe 30% of the, you you held on to some players, but not a lot. And you're refilling this thing with a lot of portal players, similar to what, you know, Auburn probably had to do last year when, when Hugh Freeze took over. And, and that's just part of coaching change. But I don't, I think that Texas A&M, is going to surprise some people. I really do. I mean, you talk about win total, you know, the win total for what is it? Over, what does it take to, to surprise people? Like, what does that mean? I think that I think I, I've said it and people and Auburn fans, I, y'all are going to laugh and that's fair. And I can accept that it's, I think Texas A&M is going to win nine football games this year. And people are really not going to like that. That's but, wild. Let's go through know, this. Let's yeah. go through this. Notre Dame. That's a loss. Right? I th- So yeah, 
That's I break the schedule down a little differently. Is how I is how I do. I'm, it. I'm just going in order here. Okay, I'm just going in order here. Okay. Notre Dame, win or loss, lose. I think, I think that it, I'm going to say loss. But okay, I agree. Yeah. McNeese win. Win. Florida win. Yeah. Agreed. Bowling Green, yes. Arkansas, yes. Missouri. I think Texas A&M beats Missouri. I think they're going to be a little bit overrated. So that's five. Mississippi State, six. Yeah. LSU? I think I think they go one and one against Texas and LSU. Or I think I think they win one of those games. E- either one. So Okay, so I'll give you the win for LSU. So that's yeah. we're at six? Yeah. Or, I right. think that's seven, right? Seven. Seven. Okay. South Carolina? I think eight. they win that game. New Mexico State, not yeah, wow. I thought y'all schedule tougher than that. No, it, it and that's my whole, when I would I, want. I'm glad you did that because mm-hmm. I knew Auburn fans were going to laugh when I said that. It's a manageable that's schedule, super manageable, 100. Your, your your two hardest road games are Auburn and Florida. I think you beat Florida. I think Auburn. I think it's it's as close as 50 50 as you can get. It really is. And then you play all of your most challenging games in front of one of the best atmospheres in college football. 110,000 people there. What I do think you think you the, the dynamic of, okay, they play Auburn on November 23rd on the road. Yeah. Would you finally get a chance to play Texas again at home the week after? How did that I, come to play? I almost commented on that a minute ago, and then yeah. I got racing on other things. Sure. You think about you Cam Coleman. I get it. You can't act like. That's not going to be in the back of their heads. You can't. Oh, I you agree. can't sit I here agree. and convince me it won't be. Anybody that, you know, if you've played any sport, baseball, football, basketball, soccer, whatever you play, you, you have a rivalry game going up, you know it's always in your head. Everybody, it, this is reality. I I think that's going to play more of a role than people are mm-hmm. discussing. I do. Um, it, but once again, you know, the whole the, the route to nine wins – you can lose to Auburn. You just have to go two and two against Notre Dame, Texas, LSU, and Missouri, which I think is more doable all at home than people are giving it credit for. I, so, I'm not going to push back against that. Yeah, I'm not going to push back against that at all. And then, okay, you go one, you go one and three in those games, and you beat Auburn and Florida and take care of business against South Carolina and mm-hmm. Arkansas. That's your route to nine and three as well. So you either go, yeah, two and two in those games. Well, for, for the Auburn folks listening, this should fire you up because you're going to get, a, if, if that happens, you're going to get a ranked Texas A&M in Jordan-Hare Stadium on November yeah. 23rd. And that's, that. especially with, I think a similar thing's going to happen with Oklahoma where they might be a, a little higher ranked than what they actually are. Um, and that's a prime opportunity to make a statement. That's a prime, yeah. especially if you're in the in, in the ballpark of, you know, the, the section of the fan base that thinks if you go nine and three, with losses to Alabama, Georgia, and a road game against Missouri. All three of those would be road games. But you have wins over a ranked Oklahoma and a ranked Texas A&M. Does that put you in the CFP discussion? It's just interesting. Yeah. It's just I think 9-3 and thing. three is going to get a team, a team or two in the playoff. I really do, yep. if you look at the numbers. Now, you know, not pushbacks the wrong word. I was say I'm going to push back, but it's more – you could have the same conversation because – the Iron Bowl is is after this game too, right? I think it's gonna be a factor. So, yeah, so I, I think it's gonna be a factor. I do out. think there's gonna be more pressure on Texas A&M I'm hosting kidding. Texas for the first. I mean, it's been years since they've played. Yeah, right. This, yeah, the SEC. So what? 2012, whenever it was when they. When yeah, so that's gonna be. I mean, that's that's a bigger deal. I think probably oh, there's some more pressure 100%. there than Auburn going to the Iron Bowl to Tuscaloosa for the Iron Bowl, yeah. but we'll see. We'll see. All right, Andrew, uh, for the Auburn folks watching, if they want more Aggie stuff, where do they go? Yeah, check on out at Locked On Aggies, anywhere you get your podcast on YouTube, free and available, wherever you find it. Um, Zach, this is a big one. You and I are going to break this one down a lot more, I I figure. Yeah, no question. Auburn fans, go to his channel and let him know how fun it is to watch Cam Coleman. I think that'll be great. I think that'll be great. Hey, uh, Auburn folks, yeah, please like the video. Please subscribe. We'll see you next time. This has been a crossover edition for Locked on Auburn and Locked on Aggies.